Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the Goldstein on Geld show, Tim Harford, who is an economist. He's the author of the over million copy selling book, The Undercover Economist, and The Undercover Economist Strikes Back, and he's at the Financial Times, and you may have even seen him on TED. Tim, real pleasure to have you. Thanks very much. Great to be on the show. So I have to apologize a little bit, uh, maybe more to the audience than to you, because I do bring on economists a lot onto the show because the listeners think that the economists know a lot about finance and financial things. But it seems that a lot of times economists don't really even deal with money. And, you know, when I listened to your TED Talk, I noticed that one of the topics you really brought up was this God complex. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that, but let me just ask if you could describe what that is, and then we'll go into a little more depth on that. Sure. Well, this was all about a, a previous book that I wrote called Adapt, which is all about making mistakes and fixing your mistakes. And the God Complex was a phrase coined by Archie Cochrane, a great Scottish doctor, an epidemiologist, and a man who was fascinated by the way doctors made decisions. And what he saw all the time was uh, doctors being overconfident, thinking they understood the answers to very complex questions, not being interested in a second opinion, not being too interested in experimental evidence, just appealing to their own sense of infallibility. And and he said, you know, you are you are killing people because you are you are assuming knowledge that you don't really have. You're too overconfident. And this is what he called the God complex. And what I found is is this is just a, a classic problem for politicians, for business people, and of course for economists like me. We it's very easy to be overconfident in, in the face of what is actually a very complex system. So what does it mean to be an expert in something if you're not allowed to be confident in what you believe? Well, I think it's it's there is certainly such a thing as uh, expertise, but experts, uh, unless we're dealing with really very simple problems, they've always got to recognize the, the possibility that they are wrong, the possibility that they there was some complexity, some detail they overlooked, some mechanism they didn't really understand. And so you've always got to be open to changing your mind. You've always got to be on the lookout for disconfirmatory evidence for you know, evidence that proves you wrong. Um, and actually a classic example of this that I'm personally fascinated by is two great economists, Irving Fisher and John Maynard Keynes, two of the greatest economists of the 20th century, um, both very interested in investing, both very interested in finance. Mm -hmm. And um, in the end, Keynes made a fortune and Fisher lost a fortune. And it wasn't because Keynes was a better economist than Fisher. They were both great economists. It was because Fisher, at the, the depths of the Wall Street crash, wouldn't change his mind, wouldn't acknowledge that he was wrong. Whereas Keynes said, oh, I screwed up. I made a terrible mistake. I need to change my approach. And he has this, there's this very famous saying from Keynes, you know, when the facts change, I change my opinion. And that's, a, that's an important skill for any expert, especially for people dealing with the economy and finance, because it's terribly complicated. Okay, so that, that gives us the, the ability to, let's say, have some humility if you're an expert in something. So can the two go together? Can you sort of, I don't want to say godlike, I don't want to feel godlike, but, you know, my day job is I'm a financial advisor, and people really do look to me for advice, and I can't tell them, you know, let's do some trial and error for the next five years and you know, see how it works with you, and then... You know, maybe we'll change our path or maybe we won't. You know, it's, I think it's a real tension because, for, for one thing, uh, admitting that you don't really know the answer, admitting that, you know, it's complicated, it's uncertain, it, it makes you look less competent to a non-expert. You, your authority is damaged. And the guy who says, leave it to me, I understand perfectly what's going on and makes very confident sounding forecasts, well, that person sounds very authoritative, but he's, he's, he's the one you should be suspicious of. As a, as a member of the public, you should be very wary of the person who makes it sound easy and makes it sound as though the future is all predictable. Uh, and so there's a tension. When, whenever we make a forecast, financial forecast or, or any other kind of forecast, there are different things that we're doing. One thing is we might be trying to actually predict the future. But a lot of what we're doing when we make a forecast is we are selling something. We are selling an idea of our own competence. We are attracting attention. 
uh, to ourselves. And so, I mean, Doug, I'm sure you have a lot of people on your show who make forecasts about where the market's going. And <laughs> really, we know, you know, I don't know, you don't know, they don't know, but they do sound good when they're saying it, don't they? And, and even though you know they don't really know, it, it's, it's hypnotic to listen to them. They, it's so reassuring. They sound, they sound experts. And the funny thing is that when you are, even when you are an expert, and frankly, I like to think of myself as an expert in my field, but I, I have to say, I fully agree with everything you're saying, meaning it's important to realize that we cannot predict the future. But I think that even when people feel like, uh, like they're experts, if they present it in that way, in many ways, they are able to help the, the clients more because if you don't have confidence in anyone, you'll often just be mired in, um, in, doing nothing and that can be a terrible position for people in handling their money absolutely and i mean there are things i think we can be confident in our, uh, confident in uh, in the world of finance i think there are rules of thumb that are very robust there are certain principles that are very robust and uh, but what we can't be confident in is the market's going this way the market's going that way uh, gold is a steal uh, you should sell oil or whatever right. we can never right. be confident <laughs> in that kind of thing but that certainly there are there are sound principles that are well established and have been very robust over the years and and of course those are what we should be advocating as economists or as financial planners we are talking with economist Tim Harford, who wrote the book, The Undercover Economist. The Undercover, Undercover Economist Strikes Back. They are fascinating books. You should also look Tim up on TED, and we'll put links to, to that at the show notes at goldsteinongelt.com for today's show. Tim, one of the things that you have advocated is the trial and error method, which is try and make a mistake and try again and make a mistake and do this over and over again. There is a tool that a lot of financial planners use called a Monte Carlo simulation, which we've spoken about on this show, which is basically where we try many, many, many uh, possible futures and we get a sense for not what will happen, but what are the odds that something will happen. Does that Monte Carlo simulation fit in with your trial and error approach? I think it's complementary. I mean, I think it's a, it, you're dealing with a slightly different problem when you are uh, simulating financial probabilities because uh, you know, the market has already anticipated a lot of what you might do. Um, and so, I mean, if you imagine, uh, say, experimenting with a new, um, a new business model, then maybe you're going to set up a, a new kind of a burrito bar or whatever. You're going to sell burritos. And so you experiment, you know, you get the perfect recipe, you get the perfect marketing, you try it all out, the perfect service model. And once you've figured it all out, then you expand your chain of burrito restaurants. It's hard to do the same thing if you're buying shares in a burrito restaurant. You, you can't sort of buy the share, wait to see if it goes up and then buy lots more because well, that's too late, yeah, because the, the, mm -hmm. the price of the stock already went up and you, you missed your opportunity to make a killing. So it is, I think, a harder problem in finance than it is in other areas of, of the economy or policy or social policy, etc. Because a, a lot of the opportunities I'm talking about in my book, Adapt, are opportunities where you get to experiment, but then once you've actually found a solution, you get to exploit that at scale. And that is a harder thing to do if we're talking about a stock portfolio. So let's let's go back to this and focus a little more because I think one of the areas that people make a mistake in managing their money is that they they think about how much money can I make, how profitable can I be, and as a financial planner, I spend a lot more time trying to say what are you trying to do, what's your goal, and you know when you work back, normally goals are things like I want to be able to retire and pay the bills every month till I die, and to me it seems like a a Monte Carlo simulation which can test the odds of whether you could do that is much more useful for making the decision. Again, because we're, we're talking about real-life situations where everyone has to make a decision for himself. We're not statistics. You, you see people as statistics. But, but each of us has to decide and make sure that we're going to be okay in the future. That wasn't a question. <laughs> so my question is, this: <laughs> does it make sense, do you think, in terms of, let's say, financial planning for people even to do any financial plans? Oh, I think I think it does. But I think you're absolutely right to stress Monte Carlo, because that it, it, that contains the whole idea of Monte Carlo simulations contains the idea of uncertainty. And I think we also need to think about uncertainty in a qualitative way. We need to think about scenarios. One of my former careers was a scenario planner. And scenarios are almost like they're almost like science fiction. You're thinking about well, what if this? What if that? And actually, um, a lot of the, the basic tools 
um, the, the sort of the cut out, the cookie cutter stuff you get off, a, off the Internet to help you think about financial planning. They're not very good because they don't think through qualitatively the real uncertainties. So you often find you're trying to calculate your pension contributions. And it'll say, well, how much do you earn? How much do you want to make when you retire? How old are you? When are you going to retire? What pay rise you, do you expect each year? Uh, and you type all those things in and it says, right, you need to contribute uh, 17% of your salary or whatever. But actually, that do- your real risks are nothing to do with that. Your real risks are, will you get divorced? Will you get ill? Uh, Will your children get ill? Um, Will you lose your job? Uh, Will you lose your job just at the wrong moment? And actually, those scenarios, uh, which a good financial planner or really any wise advisor would tell you to think about and to guard against, they often get omitted from these these sort of very simple tools that you can just find on any website. uh, the, The quantitative approach is very, very useful, but it needs to be combined with a bit of imagination about you know, the different problems that might come along. Got it. So what you're pointing out, which I think is critical, is that let's say someone does a Monte Carlo simulation in a financial plan. That is a, a theoretical view of what can happen. By the way, let me just mention for people who want, because we, Monte Carlo simulations are very complicated, in fact, and we're just saying it quickly. There's a, a, a video that uh, that I made based on the book on chess and investing that I wrote with Susan Polgar. So if anyone wants to learn about Monte Carlo videos, just go to richasaking.com slash Monte Carlo video, and we'll put a link there. It's a seven-minute video that just explains to you what this is all about. But I just want to summarize what Tim is saying, which is there's real life which always gets in the way. Losing your job, getting divorced, getting sick, and if you don't plan for that, and of course no one plans for it, but if you don't have some sort of emergency fund to prepare for it, you're probably setting yourself self up for failure. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Tim, we're really just about out of time, but I did want to cover one point about your newest book and then and then we're going to wrap up. You talk in the undercover economist strikes back about the importance for the average layperson to know about macroeconomic concepts. At the end of the day, there's nothing I can do about it or you can do about it. We just sort of and we can't predict it certainly. What's the point? Well, I think it makes us smarter consumers. It makes us smarter voters. Uh, we're better able to make decisions at the, at the ballot box. But really, the point for me about all of this is it's just fascinating. I mean, economics is, <laughs> is it's all around us. As Keynes said, it involves you know, philosophy and futurology and history and rhetoric and mathematics and literature and psychology. And it's all combined into this one big uh, insoluble subject. We'll never understand it. We'll never fully get to grips with the economy. It's too complicated. That's why it's, it's just so fascinating to talk about, to think about to argue about. I, I love it. And that's why I keep writing books about it. I just, I just want to share the joy with everybody. So yes, it's useful. But more than that, uh, it's just a fascinating, vital thing to think about, to read about, to learn about. And I certainly think as a plug for the books, which are great, uh, Tim presents it in a fascinating way. So if you studied economics in school and that was your nap time, don't be discouraged. You should definitely check out the book. So, Tim, in the last few seconds, tell us, how can people follow you and your work? Well, the, the important thing is my name is Tim Harford, H-A-R-F-O-R-D. So that gives you the website, timharford.com, the Twitter handle, at Tim Harford, the Financial Times column, everything very easy to find at that point. Okay, and we will put a link to all of that at the show notes of goldsteinongelt.com. Tim, thanks so much for your time. Thanks a lot, Doug. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with international investment expert Doug Goldstein. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, go to www.goldsteinongelt.com or write to Doug directly at doug at profile-financial.com. 